So let me say thank you for this opportunity to be able to moderate the English program today, which relates with the Khmer New Year as we are approaching to the day three or the last day of the Cambodian New Year. It is such an auspicious occasion for all Cambodians across the globe who have been celebrating New Year's, Khmer New Year for these few days. And first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to pay my homage to the Triple Gem, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And again, I would like to pay respect to most venerable Atimani Mangsang, Pre Atimani Mangsang, the president of the Cambodian Buddhist Monk Society in USA, who currently resides or, or the abbot of Minnesota Ram Monastery in the state of Minnesota, USA. And again, I would like to pay respect to uh, most venerable Price Ran, uh, who is in Georgia, Venerable Pastor Paul, who is in Massachusetts, and Venerable Sitong from, uh, uh, from Texas, and all Venerable Monks are from different states, and those who are watching us as well would like to pay respect and say greeting to uh, every Khmer people around the globe who happen to watch this show. As today, we are conducting the Khmer New Year for uh, the day three or the final day because we celebrated, uh, usually we traditionally we celebrated for three days. So uh, for the last two days, the English program also has have been conducted uh, and the speakers have uh, delivered a lot of information containing with the Khmer New Year about the meaning, about the purpose of the Khmer New Year, the benefit and the activities uh, that exist in each and every day of the new year. So again, for this the last day, I would like to uh, create some question for our speakers joining with us. It is a great honor for, for all of us today. I have invited uh, Venerable Kasupa Hon Kamara, who currently resides in the uh, Vipassana Turia Buddhist Center of the Kingdom of Cambodia. And Venerable is also the uh, uh, prof uh, the lecturers, also the meditation trainer uh, in Phnom Penh, Cambodia right now. And again, also in the, I have invited uh, Sister Jenny, who is also currently reside in Seattle. And she is the first generation of Cambodian American who was born and raised in Seattle. And hopefully we can uh, learn a lot uh, from both of the speakers, especially Sister Jenny, um, who was born here. And so we could uh, learn. I think we can learn a lot from you as a Cambodian American who grows up and witness the celebration of Khmer New Year in in America, especially in the state of Washington. And um, without further ado, I would like to because we have um, around thirty to forty minutes for this uh, English program. So I hope that with, within this very short period of time, we could. Uh, make the best use of our time to cover as much as possible in English version uh, in the hope that um, this information can be helpful to our younger, younger generation to uh, be able to understand about the Khmer culture, especially the uh, traditional, the rituals, practices that contain in the Khmer New Year itself. Like today is the third day or the last day of Khmer New Year. One of the most important activity uh, in the third day is about uh, basing the Buddha statue as uh, most memorable speakers here have already have been mentioning about the it is Rang Pre or basing the Buddha, the Buddha statues. And some people also, they do basing their elders, their parents, their grandparents. So it would have some lesson learn from that activity. Anyway, without further ado, I would like to start uh, the first question with uh, Sister Jenny. Welcome Sister Jenny to the show. And I would like to ask you to introduce about Khmer New Year. And of course, uh, we have been talking a lot about what Khmer New Year is, but uh, for myself, and I believe that our Cambodian monks also would like to learn uh, because a lot of uh, foreigners will come to the temple and they ask, what is Khmer New Year? So what would you explain to the foreigner about what Khmer New Year is as a, Cam as a Cam Cambodian American? Yes. 
Hi, thank you for inviting me uh, to this discussion. I wanna give my um, respect and homage to the Triple Gem, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Um, and again, thank you for involving me in this discussion today. Uh, you know, on a general term, when I explain Cambodian New Year to foreigners or people who are unfamiliar with it, I usually just kind of describe that, you know, in Cambodia, April happens to be the hottest month of the year and it happens to be towards the end of the harvest season. And so many lay people are kind of uh, um, able to relax um, after a hard season um, of uh, tilling the farm and, and harvesting. And so um, it's an opportunity for us to uh, to celebrate uh, and also an opportunity for us to go visit the temple because our day-to-day -day lives are so uh, busy that oftentimes we forget to do the basic um, uh, practice of generosity. And so we get the opportunity while we are not working to attend, go to the temple to um, uh, build merit and collect merit for ourselves and for our elders and for our ancestors. Um, and um, you know, we do that by offering alms to the monks and also donating to the temple, uh, monetary or gift wise. Um, and so that's kind of on general terms, that's kind of how I, I explain it to foreigners. Um, then there's also the Buddhism aspect that I'm still actually kind of learning about as well. Um, uh, and so uh, there, there is a correlation because, you know, it's not just Khmer New Year's. We know that in Thai and in Laos and in Sri Lanka and Burma and Malaysia, they all celebrate New Year's around this time too. And the common, the common, um, the thing that connects it is Buddhism. Um, but I would rather have a monk speak on that, that aspect of um, Cambodian New Year. Thank you so much, Jenny, for sharing from your perspective as a lay person and as a Cambodian American who was born here. Uh, how you explained to foreigner was um, very interesting. And I believe that uh, sometimes for us as a monk, we always, when we are introducing about Khmer New Year, I myself always think about the Khmer language, what I have uh, read from the Khmer books, from the Khmer text, you know. But what you have introduced just right now is like a little bit different from what I have ever used, you know. So it's a good thing to learn something new from uh, from foreigner like like yourself. You're actually a, Cam a Cambodian American, but, uh, you know, because you're born and raised here, so uh, you consider as one of the native speaker that we can learn a lot from you. Thank you so much for that. And let me turn back to Venerable uh, Kaspa Hun Kamara. What about you? How can you introduce about Khmer New Year and as you have been living in Sri Lanka for around 20 years and Sri Lanka itself also celebrated the, the new year, which is, you know, happened at the same time with Cambodia. So how would you explain uh, Sri Lankan people about Khmer New Year? Your, your mute. Thank you, Honorable Sir. And let me pay my homage to the Triple Gen and dear Honorable Sirs, the president of Cambodian Buddhist Monk Society and our friends, in Dhamma around the globe, and especially Cambodian devotees who are living in the United States. Well, like it, it's a broad subject to be honest, uh, to express in one uh, sentence, but uh, if I would have a chance to tell Sri Lankan uh, devotees or Sri Lankans about Khmer New Year, I would say that uh, it is a unification of religious, uh, cultural, traditional, uh, elements, uh, or I would say that it, it kinds of uh, practices uh, unify the three elements together and to show the world that in during my new year, we not just practice uh, Buddhism, but we practice, uh, we, we respect our traditions. And uh, I mean, in terms of culture that we have been uh, hand or, or over that I, our, by our uh, ancestors. So another term, I would say that this is the unique Khmer identity. This, this is our uh, national day. And I would say that it is a spiritual transition. It is a spiritual uh, transformation. Or we would say that it, it is a spiritual innovation that whatever we have done in the past, we will change it or we will uh, you know, further cultivate it to some extent for a better life. So this is, I would say, to Sri Lankan 
devotees, especially the foreigners. That's all from me, Venerable Sir. Thank you so much for sharing how you introduced the Khmer New Year to the foreigners. So you talk about the cultural, the spiritual transition. It's not just transitioning the time as we aware that New Year is like the transitioning between the old and the new year. And of course, today is the third day, the day which uh, transition from the old year to the new year. So the new year starts today. As a matter of fact, uh, the monk has been talking about the the Sakaraj has been transitioned today, you know, from Tosa to Traisa today. So, of course, as you have uh, pointed out about the spiritual transition uh, during each and every new year, something uh, could be transitioned, something could be transformed from bad to good, from, you know, suffering to happiness and so on. And again, uh, as we observe in the activities uh, during the Khmer New Year's, and uh, I would like to turn that to Jenny, uh, Jenny because you have been, uh, you know, coming to uh, practice the rites and ritual during the Khmer New Year at the temple. Uh, what have you observed about some activity that yeah, you think is like uh, interesting to you? You know, we have like people gathering to the temple, they uh, listening to the Dharma talk, they listening to the monks doing the chanting, um, you know, they cook the food and take it to the temple, offer to the monks. They do the, the rock bath, you know, the, like offering arms to the monks both. And then uh, they also offer the donation, uh, everything that they bring to the temple, paying, paying homage to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, observing uh, moral precepts, practicing, you know, meditation and so on. Uh, what is the most uh, favorite part of uh, what is the most, uh, you know, like interesting activity for you during the command new year? Uh, yeah, I think the one of the most uh, fun and interesting part of Khmer New Year's, you know, uh, Cambodian New Year's also, in America is also a time for us Cambodian people to really get together and to learn about our culture, to witness our own culture. And so, of course, there's the being able to witness uh, like all of the classical dances and, you know, the, the drummers, the Chai Yam is really fun as well, too. Um, and also just being able to come together and play some traditional games and whatnot. Um, but as far as like the, 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 the Buddhism aspect goes, I really enjoy um, the, um, after the monks eat, the lay people all get together and we share a meal. Of course, this is before COVID, <laughs> uh, um, but that was probably my, my favorite just because we're all enjoying our efforts that we put together. You know, um, most of everyone have brought food to the temple to share, to offer the monks. And then afterwards we get to share in that experience as well. And, you know, a lot of the times you're sitting with another family and you're just getting to know. And, um, you know, I think maybe people in Cambodia kind of take for granted that you're always surrounded by Khmer people all the time. And for us growing up in America, that's not the case. The only time we're around Cambodian people is when we go to the temple and that's every once in a while. And so it just feels so good to be able to go to a place where everyone kind of knows what's happening. You know, everyone's eating the same food. Everyone is just enjoying each other's language and seeing the old aunties and uncles and the, you know, the family friends that you haven't seen in a while. So it's an opportunity for us just to come together and just enjoy each other's company. Um, another favorite activity of mine is the last day, the song, uh, song plan, I think is what it's called, um, uh, yeah. where we, we do the water blessing ceremony. And um, uh, I love being able to, uh, to not only bless the statues of the monk, but also bless the, the elders as well. Um, at the temple, at the South Park temple, we had all the elders lined up or, or sitting next to each other. And then all of the youth comes and we sprinkle water into their hands and we're doing well wishes and just, just wishing prosperity, happiness and long life to each other. And then it's such a joy to witness because these elders, they look like little children too when they, <laughs> when they come out of the room and they're also blessing us. And the next thing you know, we're all just having fun, having a water fight, you know? And it's, um, again, that's just so, it's so endearing to witness because I don't really get to see that. I don't, I'm not sure of any other cultures that have such a strong connection between um, uh, or not a strong connection, but a strong ritual of respecting elders. 
And so that is really unique to see and also um, very uh, joyful and endearing too. So that's my two favorite things is just sitting, catching up with old friends um, and being around other Khmer people and also the, the water fight at the end of the, the, the celebration. That is very impressive uh, what you have mentioned. I think that is a good, like, we can say it's a unique point about uh, Khmer New Year celebration. Sometimes we cannot find this in any other, you know, practices, traditional practices, but uh, in the activity, like, you know, the way we pay respect to our elders, the way we get connected, you know, with our ancestors, with our elders, you know, get surrounded by uh, the younger generation, uh, you know, paying respect to the elders and uh, do the wishing by, you know, placing holy water on the hands and the monks' hands as well. So we'll come to that in a moment. But I just, um, I'm interested about when you talk about the part where you're interested is about, you know, people get together, it, you know, enjoy the meal together after the monks. Um, uh, what what is your favorite Khmer food, by the way? Because in Khmer New Year, people are cooking, uh, you know, traditional food and bring to the temple. Also, can you count some uh, Khmer traditional food as well as you know? And what is the most favorite food, Khmer food for you? Uh, for me, my favorite Khmer food involves anything that has like a hint of pahok and of course krung in there. So cha krung, um, you know, pahok ti is one of my favorites. Is one of my son's favorite. Um, my husband, who was white American, he loves chamasua. He loves any, <laughs> like any time. Okay. Yeah, chamasua is his favorite. Um, of course, anything with curry. I mean, I love Khmer food. And I know that every time I go to the temple, I know the elders are cooking it. So we're getting authentic Khmer food. And um, I mean, that's probably why it's one of my favorites, too, just because I don't cook Khmer food at home. Um, very often. And um, when I do, it just doesn't taste as good as mom's, right? And so um, going there and, you know, I know that a lot of the, the elders, they put a lot of effort into um, into the food. And so you know that you're going to be getting really good, authentic Khmer food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great about it. You know, I have some foreign friend who study with me at the college. Uh, and when I introduce about Khmer New Year to them, they say, what is the special thing about Khmer New Year? I said, if you don't like about the religious practices, maybe you like about the, the food because there are a lot of different kinds of food, you know, bringing, they bring to the temple. So once they come and join us and they enjoy the food, I think that is one of the best way to promote our Khmer New Year to foreigners mm -hmm. to the world, right? So mm -hmm. we'll come to that question later. And thank you for, you know, talk raising about the some a unique activity we have in the Khmer New Year. So let me move back to Venerable Kasapa. Uh, what is your philosophy uh, about the, you know, Piti Srang or the way we base the Buddha statues and also the, the way we pay respect to our elders, our parents by placing holy water or basing them with, you know, perfume water, like Jenny was just saying. What is your uh, idea concerning about it? Is it a good way to, you know, in, interact between the younger generation and with the elder gen generation. Yeah, thank you, Rambal, sir. And, and, and it is also one of my most favorite activity because it manifests a lot of things in Buddhism in, in our culture. And as you mentioned, I have been in Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka is celebrating their new year on the same day. So, but tomorrow is the final day as to the best of my knowledge, they have kinds of, in Singlish we call it nanu mangala, it's kinds of bathing, but they don't really uh, having bath. They use the holy oil and uh, to do the blessing and the monks and the people line up and following each other to get the blessing from the monks or from, from the elders. They use the holy oil and to do the blessing. But the uniqueness of our culture as Sister Janet mentioned, that exactly, uh, you know, brilliant. And I mean, the uh, I mean, before I'm going to dissect the philosophy, the philosophy behind that, I would say that this is a uniqueness of our culture that we have a chance, even once a year, to express our gratitude, to express our respect, and even to say sorry uh, to the monks, you know, to the elders, what we have been done throughout the year. So it, it's a chance for everyone to express 
uh, and you, you know their spiritual uh, power that's as i mentioned the forgiveness uh, the, uh respectfulness uh, gratitude uh, to everyone and from buddhist perspective it is uh, exactly spot on and accurate because you know you know that there are 10 uh, uh, basis of meritorious deeds one is apachayana it means that respectfulness and when you do respecting to someone you must be motivated by loving kindness this is this is what the buddha want us to understand and and as, and as sister Yenin said that it is very unique because we connect everything together uh, buddhism culture uh, society food so we i mean before we do the bathing to to the elders or, or to the monks we must start from the buddha and he is our spiritual father he is our spiritual master he is our spiritual teacher so we cultivate that respectfulness uh, from bottom of our heart with loving kindness to the buddha and then uh, ranging from the Buddha, we, we, we go up, we, we go to the monk uh, and, and the elders. So the philosophy behind this is we have the opportunity to cultivate our spirituality. That is why I call it a, a spiritual transition, a spiritual transformation, that we have a chance to cultivate our respect to the Buddha. And by using the water, what we are trying to do is, and, and I, I, I listened to the Khmer talk, uh, delivered by a monk that yes uh, the, the the body of the buddha is not touched by even the you know the, uh, the the dust or he 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 doesn't experience the dirtiness uh, i mean physically but what we are doing is we express our gratitude we express our respectfulness that we have everything we enjoy the spirituality we enjoy as sister uh, uni said sharing is caring we share i mean generosity, everything we learn from the Buddha, everything in our life, we, we learn how to forgive, we learn how to respect the elders, we learn how to share, we learn how to practice, practice generosity because of the Buddha. That is why in order to get the blessing, we must get from him. That is why we practicing uh, wedding uh, ceremony. So let me wrap up. What I want to say to our young generation is, it is a unique practice in our culture. We have a chance to respect to the Buddha. We have a chance to respect to the monks. We have a chance to respect the elders. And in return, I mean, this is the question that has been raised by our generation: that what will we, uh, what what will we? I mean, what will benefit for us from kinds of rites or rituals? To be honest, when your heart is touched, okay, when your heart is touched by loving kindness. When your heart is when your heart is touched by respectfulness, this is the greatest benefit you are gaining. So, don't talking about the next bird. Don't talking. I mean, uh, you know, in terms of deep philosophy, when your when your heart is moved, when your heart is touched to respect the elders, and when your heart is refreshed by forgiveness, when your heart is refreshed by uh, seeking apologies. This is the great uh, benefit of these kinds of ceremony. So that that's all from me, Venerable Sir. Thank, thank you so much for sharing about uh, you know the meaning and also the benefit, the philosophy behind how we do the basing uh, of the Buddha statues and also the monks and the elder. It has a, a hidden, amazing philosophy behind it. You know, at least to um, explain people that uh, we have to pay our respect to our benefactors like the Buddha, who is the, our spiritual father, and also our elders who have given us the birth, the life to exist in this world. So once a year, why not we uh, base our living God, you know, uh, the Buddha is already passed away, but the way we do it, just a kind of expression to be grateful uh, for what uh, the Buddha has um, bestowed it, uh, for us. And again, uh, it's a good um, unity among my people as a younger generation, we can get together with our elders and doing something in respect to them. So let me uh, move back to uh, Sister Jenny, because you have been uh, born in here and growing up in Seattle. I just, want, I just would like to know, 
how well known the Khmer New Year is to to our Khmer Americans, uh, especially in Washington State, or if you could share, you know, just from your personal perspective, how do you think about the popular popularity about Khmer New Year to the foreigners or to the uh, Khmer Americans? Uh, yeah, I think for Khmer Americans, it's probably one of the best things, um, the best celebration of the year. It's the only time of the year that we really truly connect with our community and our culture and our traditions and rituals, um, something that you don't experience every day. And so, um, one sec. Um, and uh, for foreigners, I think that it's an opportunity to learn something new, right? Um, Cambodian culture is so different from Western society that I think that Western or, you know, foreigners just have a unique or not a unique, but um, a deep interest in why we do what we do. Um, but for a lot of Khmer Americans, especially the younger generation, we kind of just go with the flow, right? We, we, when I was younger, I kind of just went with my mom and dad. Um, and I always stood right next to my mom's side as she's doing, you know, getting low and um, doing the alms. And so I kind of grew up not knowing why we do what we do. Um, I just know that it's something that we do. Like this, that's what makes us Khmer, we just do it. <laughs> Um, and anytime I, uh, when I was younger, I would ask like, why do we do this? Um, a lot of the times, a lot of the answers were, um, at least the people around me, it was kind of just like, oh, it's because it's always been done this way. Um, and it's very difficult to explain it. Um, unfortunately I have dealt with like, um, language barrier. And so even if I did have the opportunity to learn from somebody about like why we do it, um, it's, it's difficult to comprehend what they're telling me, you know? Um, and so there's kind of, there's this, I think um, as a first generation, I think many of us who are in our thirties and forties and, and having young children, we're starting to realize like, wow, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of disconnected from our culture and tradition um, mostly because, you know, we don't live it in our day-to-day -day lives. We're so busy with everything else and assimilating to Western culture and, and things like that. Um, and so there's right now, there's this deep, uh, deep interest within the, 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 the first and second generation Khmer Americans to really connect with their culture at all costs. You know, um, it doesn't matter how we absorb it, whether it's through YouTube, whether it's, um, you know, Facebook and connecting with other Khmer people all around the country. Um, we're, we're, we're doing everything um, possible just to reconnect with that roots. And we're starting to see the benefits of it too. I think that growing up as a, as a young child, you always think like, what's the point of all this? We live in America. Like, why, why do we need to do all of this stuff for? Um, and there's kind of like a frustration because of the lack of communication, being able to fully communicate all of that. But with time, um, I think people are starting to pick up, you know, as it, it's almost kind of like, a, you know, when you're younger, you don't understand your parents, but when you become a parent yourself, you suddenly understand <laughs> some of the things that they taught us, right? And, and so it's finally sinking in with our generation that like, oh, I can see why it's so important. Um, and now we're making that effort. Um, you know, some of us are enrolling our children in like my dance classes and my language, you know, that I bring my children to the temple too, um, just for them to kind of experience it and in, 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 in any way that we can. Um, but yeah, Khmer New Year is this the biggest um, celebration. It's, it's mostly because it's really fun too. Um, because, uh, you know, we get to, to see our, our traditions, our culture alive. Um, but like I said, with foreigners, I think it's, it's something unique. You know, you, you, you can learn something new every day. And, um, you know, there are many people out there that want to learn about the Dhamma, want to learn about Cambodian history. Um, but, you know, we have to remember that we're still technically a small population um, throughout the country, too. And so many people don't get exposed to Cambodian people here in America, um, unless you live in, you know, Lowell or Seattle or Long Beach. But um, for many people in America, they don't, they don't know anything about Cambodian people in our history. And 
this is an opportunity for them to learn, if, especially if they have like a Cambodian coworker, a Cambodian neighbor or a Cambodian, you know, friend, you know, you could, if you're that Cambodian friend or neighbor, um, invite your friends over and, 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 you know, just enjoy the moment with us too. Yeah, so you have been talking about some, you know, barriers and some challenges going to the temple as a Khmer American. Sometimes the language uh, could be difficult for them to understand what they do, you know. So what is your suggestion to make improvement? I mean, from, you know, the personal perspective uh, from you as a lay person, it could be we as a monk, we could learn something, you know, sometimes we have been organizing a lot of ceremony, but sometimes we cannot see our own mistake or our own shortcoming, something we lack of. So maybe as a attend, attendant, you know, as a lay person who attend the temple uh, to practice the ceremony, uh, what is something uh, you think you should, uh, we should done, have done it better, you know, for the sake of understanding our culture and Dharma? Yeah, I think um, one thing that I would like to suggest is, um, you know, Growing up, our elders kind of like uh, tells us that there's a there's a respectful way to speak to the monk, and you have to do it in this way. You have to use these terms gana, and you know you have to uh, you, you know say twai bong gom and all of this stuff. And as a young person, you don't know why, um, so it doesn't make any sense. Um, and then it feels weird because you don't do it every day. It's not a common practice. And so it ends up being really uncomfortable for a lot of people to go to the temple because they're just like, man, any wrong move I make, like somebody's going to scold me, somebody's going to tell me I'm bop. So I'd rather just go and, you know, be in the background and not participate. And I think that what would help with that um, is having the monks just um, kind of go out there and talk with, with people. Um, I don't know if there's any type of uh, rules where monks can't kind of go out in the crowd, but um, maybe there's an opportunity to be able to interact with the young children, the teenagers, um, the, you know, just random people throughout the community because, um, you know, I learned from other forms of Buddhism, you know, that like, it's okay to talk to a monk the way that you normally talk to them. <laughs> and uh, it's, to me, it's still a little uncomfortable, but I'm getting used to it. Uh, you know, for Khmer people, there's so many different ways to um, uh, refer to a monk, like Ba'ong, there's Daikun, there's Lok uh, and all of that, and all of it gets confusing. So I just use the term Bante because <laughs> it's a, a, a little, um, I don't know, just easier and uh, um, easier for me to remember. Um, yeah, that, but, that's international. Yeah, it's a Pali language used in Buddhist term. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 And so, again, that's just something that I, I learned. And I'm still kind of undoing that uncomfortableness um, as well so that it's just so that I can make my feel more at ease when I'm at the temple and feel more at ease when I'm speaking to a monk. Other than that, it, it without that, it just feels very intimidating. And I think that's a lot of the reasons why maybe some of us, um, we go to the temple, but we don't interact because we're so fearful, like that we're going to do something wrong. Yeah, thank you. I have been observing that, you know, as the Khmer New Year is being celebrated every day at our temple, and I observe that a lot of people are coming to the temple, not, you know, not just the younger generation who do not really understand what they do, but also some elder also, they just do it traditionally. That's why I think we need a lot of explanation. We need, we need a lot of time to, you know, contribute uh, the information about uh, what we do and what we want them to do, you know, besides just uh, leading them to do this and do that without uh, giving the ideas or, you know, uh, revealing the wisdom behind it. So uh, let me move to Venerable Kasapa. Maybe he has some methods, you know, if we want Khmer New Year to be well known in the world, just like Chinese New Year, everybody knows Chinese New Year. But how many people know about Khmer New Year, even among Khmer people, especially Khmer who born in, in foreign countries like, like America. And even though they know, they just, you know, like rumors, hearsay from one another, just, okay, it's a new year, go to the temple. But beside that, they don't know anything about why they do the robot, why they do the listening to the monk, why they have to pay respect to the monk. Sometimes uh, they have 
you know matters in that because uh, some Cambodian American here they they don't practice Buddhism. Some they don't they respect in you know Christianity or other religion or some they are non-religious. But when they, we ask them, our elders uh, ask them to okay raise your hand and some pay hello like pay respect to the monk. So it's kind of like you know some they think it's a, it goes again their religious uh, practices. That's why they cannot do it conveniently. So I think this should be take into consideration for our temple. We we should think about uh, you know this. Um, uh, principle of other religious people who also come to join the Khmer New Year. So what is your best way to uh, promote, uh, you know, Khmer New Year to the people, Venerable? Yeah, thank you, Venerable, sir. As, as you raised that our Khmer New Year is not uh, as popular as Chinese New Year, yeah, I, I, I strongly agree. So that, but we must, it, it, it must start from us. So the mistakes I have been witnesses is, uh, not everyone, some elders, they don't uh, create a space for the young generation to come. I mean, for me, just let them come and let us correct them later. That, that, that is my suggestion. Let them, come, let them come, let them do whatever they want and just correct them later. So this is the responsibility, responsibility of our elders. And the second responsibility is from monks. And not every month, but I want to say that we we are lacking kinds of explanation, especially monks. Uh, sometimes the way they express, the way they explain is not that logic, logical, it's not that uh, philosophical and cannot be absorbed by the young generation. So because this is where we, we are getting stuck to promote our culture. So from understanding education, like uh, understanding, right understanding is very important. So to, to have the right understanding, we need a right explanation. This is my point. So we have to uh, create a space for young generation uh, to understand our culture of, I mean, besides the rituals and religious activities, I would suggest that monks, you can uh, reserve of one or two hours for young generation to ask you the question. Or, or on the other hand, you can invite some guest speakers to, to share the, the core philosophy of our Khmer New Year. Uh, then this would be uh, beneficial from my understanding. And, and as Sister Janet said that everyone is, you know, interested in food, so we can share that, that when, when we're talking about generosity, so the practice must come from the monk. So whoever come to the temple, I mean, outsiders from, can be from other religion, from, from other culture, but the uniqueness of every culture is generosity. Sharing is caring. So food is the most important kinds of how to say that, I, how to use the word that absorption or, or interact, yes, we can say interact, uh, interact the people uh, to our community to understand our community because, uh, because people are, uh, you know, are interested in food. So, and as Sister Janice, you know, there's not something wrong with, with the role for the monk to talk with, uh, uh, with, the, with the devotees. No, we are allowed to talk, uh, we are allowed to interact, but as long as you don't do any kinds of uh, breaking the rules, talking talking is allowed. So uh, we must a little bit be close to the young generation and because they will be our, you know, uh, next generation uh, to carry on, uh, to protect, to conserve these rites and rituals if, if they don't have kinds of uh, understanding of, of Khmer New Year, uh, it, it's really tough to promote uh, our Khmer Year because uh, the Khmer Year will, will be restricted uh, within uh, within the Khmer generation, uh, Khmer population. And uh, and I, Sister Jenny said that we, you don't have a chance to interact with the Khmer people. Uh, we interact with the Khmer people during the New Year or going to the temple. So this is the best chance for us when we are with uh, when, when our Khmer generation 
are associating with the you know foreigners in the United States. So when they have a right understanding, they will share our culture to everyone. So this is the way uh, we can promote it. So from my understanding, let them do, let them come. We will explain them later. So they Thank are, you. yeah, that, that, that's yeah. all for me. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, there is a lot of things you raised about the way we can promote the Khmer New Year, you know, to be well known to our, at least uh, Khmer who born in uh, foreign countries like America. So it is the duty, responsibility of us as Buddhist monk, as the organizer, manager of the temple, we should have, uh, as you mentioned, arranged, you know, give the floors to our young generation younger generation to interact and be able to ask, you know, question. We open the floor for Q&A uh, during the new year, at least, you know, create for, you know, like a platform of one hour, two hours, so people can come and ask questions about what is Khmer New Year? Why did we do celebrate it? What does this mean? Why we do this and do that? What's the benefit of that? Okay, Sister Jenny, you have anything, any other ways to promote Khmer culture to our, uh, you know, Cambodian Americans or foreigners? Yeah, I think uh, Monte Kasapa kind of hit the nail on the, um, you know, it starts with us first. And, you know, there's so much suffering in the world that when you see people or a group of people celebrating and being in a joyous occasion, sharing, you know, uh, and just celebrating one another, people will take an interest in that. And they want to know, wow, like, I feel like um, one of the most admirable thing about our culture and our history is that despite the conflicts um, that we've been involved in, we've been able to pick ourselves up and still manage to um, to celebrate ourselves. You know, sure, it has taken time, but it's finally here. And I think that that is a story that many people from all walks of life um, would be interested in. But it starts with us, right? We have to enjoy it we have to celebrate it we have to understand it um so that we can better promote it to people um outside of our community um in a technical term or for a technical aspect one of the ways that we can better promote Khmer new year also is you know inviting um important community members uh, like our local politicians city councils board of directors for your school um you know maybe the principal of your local elementary school or you know middle or high school and invite them to come in and 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 witness it for themselves um you can also if you're a very well connected person maybe invite the local media um uh, maybe invite somebody who writes for the newspaper and do a story on this particular moment, um, this particular celebration. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's one of the best ways to promote it is, you know, for, for us, my people, just keep doing what we do and get together, celebrate. Um, but, you know, take the effort to learn why we do these things, you know. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, you know, begin to invite uh, folks, you know, tell our stories to people. Um, to our friends that are not part of our community. Um, and uh, it's an opportunity for us to learn about our own stories and history. And when we learn about those things, it empowers us as well. And it makes us even more proud to share um, ourselves with, with the outer community. I apologize for my son crying there. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing a lot of, uh, you know, good ways to we can uh, engage with the, you know, local authorities around, you know, the, the place where we live so that we can promote the Khmer New Year through those uh, um, platforms, you know, like the the school, as you mentioned, I'm very interesting about the school, you know, uh, most of the monks here attend the school why not we invite our friends from the school to join? Okay, as we're running out of time, I would like to give um, the last question uh, to Brent Borka uh, Yesterday, the monk has been talking a lot already about the blessing, and I just would like to talk a little bit about that uh, because as we wrap up the Khmer New Year today, you know, the last day of the Khmer New Year, uh, we would like to know the benefits of celebrating the Khmer New Year. You know, some uh, religious as well as the Buddhist practices that we have been uh, than uh, through generosity, donation, you know, offering meditation, um, observing moral precepts, 
um, you know, paying respect to our elders and the grateful ones, uh, so and so. Uh, what are the benefits that we can get from that? And with that, uh, is that the way to gain a blessing in your idea? What is like the way that we can uh, gain the new year blessing? Yeah, thank you, Venable, sir. So as I mentioned earlier, the entire uh, process of Khmer New Year, um, in terms of forming different rites or rituals, uh, is the way to gain the blessing. Let me bring your attention to the one discourse. The Buddha said in Adhamika Sutta, like very briefly, so when the human beings are disciplined, okay, the entire cosmology uh, will proceed on course. Then later on come to the season, come to the day, come to the year, uh, and then it, it, uh, it goes to the divine beings. So the divine beings will be happy. When the divine beings are happy, are not upset, the rain will fall in season. So when the rain falls in season, the crops uh, uh, will, uh, yeah, uh, will be healthy, will be, yeah, will be good. So we people who eat the crops will be a long live, uh, strong, beautiful, and healthy. So what, what I want to say here is, as I mentioned earlier, the entire process of performing the Khmer New Year rituals is the way to gain the blessing. So it kind of uh, interconnected with, with, with spirituality, with cosmology, and with divine being. So that, that is why we are advised, we have been recommended to do generosity, to pay homage to the monks, to uh, having the, the, the bathing ceremony and so on. So all wholesomeness or, or those meritor, uh, merit, uh, meritorious deeds are the way to gain a blessing because it purifies our mind. It, so when our mind is purified, the entire cosmology is purified. So when the entire cosmology is purified, the divine beings are happy. So monk, I mean, in order to gain the blessing from the monks, from the divine beings, as we believe in, in, in our Khmer tradition, so you have to cultivate divine qualities. So in Khmer, in, in Bali, we call it Satya, uh, Sal, Chakya, and so on. Uh, so these kinds of divine qualities must be cultivated must be practiced. So without faithfulness to the Buddha, you won't be able to perform all the rituals during the new year. So, uh, and, and, and in order to gain the blessing from the divine beings or new year angel, you must be equipped of these qualities. So that, that is why this uniqueness of Khmer New Year from, uh, from, other, uh, from other culture. So, we try to connect because our ancestors know it very well that the mentality, the cosmology and divine being are interconnected. So that is why everything is arranged in order to gain the blessing according to the Buddhism, according to the astrology, according to the, uh, uh, according to the uh, tribal belief system. So what I want to say, this is we, we must practice it meaningfully in order to gain the real blessing. So that's all what is, what is the lesson learned from Khmer New Year? If you could wrap up some of the lesson we can learn from Khmer New Year, like the takeaway message for our people. Uh, okay, well, uh, as, let, let me just add to what I have mentioned. Uh, when we stay away from the wholesomeness or, or the goodness, like practicing generosity, practice respecting the elders uh, and so on, we will be inflicted. This is what, what I can say. So what we have learned is Khmer New Year is a chance for us to change the way we live in order to stay healthy. So according to Buddhist perspective, COVID-19 is the result of the way we live, is the result of the, our, our lifestyle. So during Khmer New Year, as, as I told you, we purify everything mentally, physically, this is the lesson we can learn in order to, in order to interact, uh, uh, you know, the qualities, good qualities of community into our life for, in order to, 
to fight with with COVID nineteen. Thank okay, you so much, Conte. I think it's the uh, time is up, and I'm sorry for Sister Jenny also busy with her child, so we would end up our discussion uh, right right now. And I'm sorry for taking much of this time. Of course, we have a lot of questions to ask, but we don't have uh, any more time. So thank you so much for all the noble monks for allowing us this opportunity opportunity to engage with the uh, dialogue so that we can share with our younger generation to get better understanding about what my new year is, how they celebrate. It and what a benefit and lesson, moral lesson that we can learn from the Khmer New Year. And finally, I would like to accumulate merit down through this uh, Dhamma Dana, the gift of Dhamma to everybody. May all beings be liberated from physical suffering and mental suffering. Happy Khmer New Year to the world.